gonna do. But the stuff I ain't got no business doing, I can that for you. First point that I want to make to you, you heard me say this before. When it comes to your struggle of being your faith, does not exist. I don't care how faithful you are. I don't care how long you've been a member of the church. I don't care how anointed, how gifted, how talented you are. Your faith does not exempt you from this fight. That we're in. All the time we need, we need it. A word to survive. sisters, as long as you live in this world, there will always be an influence of sin in your life. It's not so much that you are a bad person or a good person. It's not that you would purposely seek to commit sin. But the fact of the matter is, in all of our lives, we will have to wrestle with the presence and the power of sin in this world. I believe it was David on Thursday night, he declared that I was shapen in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. He's not talking about a generational curse per se. He's not talking about being born under a bad sign. No, the fact is he is acknowledging what's in Psalm 51. He's saying that sin is a part of his makeup. He's saying it's in my DNA. I was born with it. It was passed on to me all the way back from Adam. And for those of us who can be honest this morning, we all have to admit that we struggle in some areas. Now, this can be a short sermon or this can be a long sermon, depending on how you respond. I said for those of us who can be honest this morning, we all have to admit that we struggle in some area. Understand now, your sin may not be as obvious as other people's sin, but denial is not an option for any of us in here. Look to your left, look to your right. I got sin, you got sin. All of God's children got some sin. And the sooner we open up and admit what's going on in our lives, you cannot expect to fix it unless you're willing to face it. Wish I had a few more witnesses in here. I said, you cannot expect to fix it if you're not first willing to face it. For the past few weeks, we've been talking about cycles in our lives, as opposed to generational curses per se. But we're talking about the cycles, these paralyzing patterns that continue to stop our progress. We have the cycle of sin in general, but then there are some more specific struggles, some more targeted struggles, which many of us have identified as unique to our situation. Here's what I mean, because I know it's early. We struggle with sin in general, but then there are some specific sins, some specific cycles that your neighbor may struggle with, but you don't. But before you judge them, there's some cycle that you struggle with that your neighbor ain't got no problem with. You're weak in some area, and it's somebody else's strength. You're strong in some area, and it's somebody else's weakness. All of us struggle with sin in general, but there are some specific areas that all of us just can't seem to help ourselves. So far, we've talked about the cycle of broken families cycle of children being born out of wedlock later on next week probably we're going to talk about the cycle of abuse 
cycle of domestic violence within our families. But the issue I want to tackle this week is the cycle of addiction. And I see what some of us are doing right away. We've already been tapped for the next 25 minutes because we can't think of nothing we addicted to. But just hang with me for a little while because believe it or not, all of us on some level, something got a hold of us. How many of y'all know somebody who's an addict? Recovering or still involved. A drug addict, an alcohol abuser, even an addiction to prescription pain uppers and, and downers, a pill to go to sleep, a pill to wake you up, a pill to get you through the day. I'm talking about addictions. I'm talking about functional addicts. Those that don't look like they're strung out. I'm talking about that pack of day smoker. The stressed out person who just need a little drink to take the edge off. I wish I had some noise here. I'm talking about the caffeine addict. I'm talking about the one that can't get through the day without your coffee fix. Keep sitting there here. I'm coming for you. Uh As I said to you before, there are some sins that are more obvious than others. And people who struggle with drugs and alcohol usually end up taking the bulk of the criticism. What about those of you who are addicted to sex? Oh, is it too early for that conversation? That's 1130 sermon, Reverend. No, I said, what about those of y'all who are addicted to sex? I'm talking about these women, these men, or a little bit of both. What about that relationship that you know is toxic, but you just can't seem to let go of that person? Can we classify you? Because by definition, something's got a hold of your body, your mind, and your spirit. You may as well say amen in here today. We're going in. For anybody who's ever struggled with any kind of addiction, I pray this message serves as conviction and comfort at the same time. Conviction because we need to stop denying it. But then comfort, because you don't have to submit to the cycle anymore. All of us have had to struggle to let something go. And so when I read through the words of Paul, brothers and sisters, I find that it ain't that complicated. He says, for we know that the law no problem with the law. He said, but I am carnal and sold unto sin. Do you see the struggle there? He says, the things I want to do, I don't do. But the stuff I ain't got no business doing, I do that fairly well. I wish I had some honest folk in here today. The first point that I want to make to you, you've heard me say this before, when it comes to your struggle of sin, your faith does not exempt you from the fight. Hear me now, I don't care how faithful you are, I don't care how long you've been a member of the church, I don't care how anointed, how gifted, how talented you are, your faith does not exempt you from this fight that we're in. I'm talking about Paul is a preacher. This is not before the Damascus Road. This is since he met Jesus. Since Jesus called him in Acts chapter 9 in red letters. Since Jesus set him aside. Since he spent three years at Ananias' house. Since he's been called. Since he's been assigned. Yet he still finds himself struggling even more than folk that don't go to church. Right about here is where I start to feel lonely because y'all start detaching. I need to know that I'm not the only person in here who's gifted and guilty. I need to know that I'm not the only person that has a relationship with Christ but still struggle each and every day. I'm telling you, you can be gifted and still going through. You can be anointed and still have a struggle. You can be in the choir and still be in conflict. Is there anybody here that can't help yourself? 
Tell your neighbor, he talking about me. He talking about me. <laughs> if you don't mind me taking this a step further, because I have in past properly exegeted this text the way you know what it's supposed to mean, but I want to take it a little further and a little differently than I usually would because for the purpose of helping somebody today, I want to look at this scripture through the lenses of an author. Let's just assume for the sake of spiritual argument that Paul is an author. He says, I know that the law of God is good for me, but there's a war He said, my body is a battleground. The stuff I know is right, I'm struggling. But the stuff that's wrong, it comes easy. In terms of the cycle, I'm trying to help you understand, folks. Uh, nobody sets out to be an author. Talk to me here. Nobody says at 12 years old, I want to be a junkie when I grow up. I want to be a drunk. I want to be a heroin addict. I want to die before the age of 35. Nobody sets out to do that. No, it's an addiction. It's a vice that takes hold of your flesh and your spirit. The sooner you understand how sin works, the better you'll be able to comprehend your own cycle and your own life. Listen, a sinner knows the difference between right and wrong. You know the difference between right and wrong. But there's something about that thing that grabs hold of you. Have I got an honest church in here this morning? It's something about that thing that just won't let you go. Adam and Eve knew fully well what God told them. God made it clear to Adam in no uncertain terms. If you eat this, you will surely die. It was spelled out. I'm sure he settled it with Eve at some point when they met the night before. But then here comes Satan. Slithering through the Garden of Eden. And he was able to convince them. Just for a moment. Hear me now. This is what sin does. It convinces you that the pain is worth the pleasure. <laughs> Just for a moment. Sin will convince you that the death you're going to experience is worth it for the moment. Because remember now, it started with experimentation. Isn't that how most addictions get started, even if you don't know what I'm talking about from experience? It starts out as experimentation, but it ends up being an addiction. And for the person who's struggling with substance abuse or a gambling habit or any other thing you can't let go of, they'll tell you they never meant for it to go to that level. You see, folks, for the addict, they know the consequences. They know that's what they're going to do. They have a plan. But it's the death that comes with that plan. That's why it's so You can throw all that out when you're dealing with an addict. Some, somebody ought to help me talk here. I said, when you think it's common sense and one plus one is two and it just don't make sense what you're doing. No, you throw all of that logic out the door when you're dealing with an addict. It takes over your mind. It takes over your moral sensibilities. It calls your name. It infuses itself into your daily existence. And pretty soon, as the years go by, it's no longer a habit. It's a critical part of your routine. How can you explain somebody stealing to support a habit? How can you uh, support someone lying to their parents and manipulating them?
You know stealing is wrong. You know you breaking your mama's heart. But when your flesh is craving a fix, you do whatever you got to do to make my mama feel good. Again, I'm applying the scripture as if Paul is an addict. He said, I know that in me, in my flesh, I am no good. Because to will is present with me, but how to do right, I ain't figured that out yet. I'm struggling. I, I, I'm battling. It's a war going on. I can't figure it out because the good that I would do, I can't seem to do. But the evil that I know is wrong, ain't got no problem doing that. He says, if I do those things that I know I shouldn't do, it's no more me that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Doesn't that sound like an addict to you? You know better. You just can't see better. And I don't want you to detach yourself from this because you ain't drunk nothing, you ain't smoked nothing, you ain't put nothing in your veins, so you figure you ain't an addict. I'm coming for y'all in about five minutes. Because there's some stuff in all of our lives that we know is wrong, but you just can't help. I don't care if it's marijuana or meat. I don't care if it's whiskey or women. I don't care how spiritual you are. When the thing got its hands on you, sometimes you just can't help it. So I need to remind you I'm applying this as my person. Because in your mind, you know better. Here's a lot of this we got. promise you, there's some people on your road who's thinking that right now. I just don't understand how folks can be eating. They just, they just ought to do right. I mean, if you know smoking will give you cancer, why don't you just give it up? Don't you want to live? Ain't you scared to lose your lungs? Ain't you scared of sclerosis of the liver? You need to put that bottle down. Seem like if you know what's good for you, you ought to just do right. Well, my self-righteous judgmental friend, the issue is not about knowing what's good. An addict knows what's good, but sometimes what's good to you is a whole nother battle. I know what's good for me. But if you never take it to God to know, and to know what it does to the mind, to the spirit, to the body, then you have no idea what it is to struggle. Here's where I need you to be honest. Anybody here ever struggle with something in your flesh that you done prayed about, that you done fasted about, that you done went to God and said, Lord, deliver me from this, but yet and still, day after day, week after week, sermon after sermon, Sunday after Sunday, you still ain't quite found a way because you just can't help yourself. I don't care what it is. There are some vices that will get a hold of you spiritually. You can tell somebody all day and all night how dangerous it is, but until you struggle with it for yourself, you have no idea what your neighbor is going through. You don't know what it is to have to make a decision every day not to take a drink. It's a decision. It's a struggle every day. You have no idea what it is to sit up at night and see. See how I snuck that in on you right there? I'm talking about those of you that eat. You just can't help yourself. Hear me now. This ain't about crack. I'm talking about Krispy Kreme, which is probably more powerful than crack. Anybody ever ran off the road trying to get to that hot light? Ah. Crack a dream, I tell you. What about these people who eat when they get crack? Eat when they feel depressed. Eat when they want to forget about their problems. Don't say it's, it's, it's impossible if that's something you never struggle with. Because the cycle of addiction in our family, it goes way deeper than just your average day and night life. I'm talking about the spirit of addiction where we fill our voids with different substances, trying to satisfy ourselves 
for the moment. It's a, it's a form of self-medicating. It's something we try to do to forget about something or to fill a void or to make up for something that's missing. And by the time that cycle gets through with you, you have lost everything, including your next generation. tell you, if we are not careful, they will have your little boy taking Ritalin at five years old because he can't sit still, because he can't be quiet, because he can't behave himself. And before you know it, they got a paper trail on this five-year-old. And the problem with that is if he's taking that at five, by the time he's 15, he's addicted to prescription medication. but they didn't do it around you. You knew something was going on back there. You knew there was a reason why you was at the kiddie table and they was at the grown folk table, but they did not expose you to all the stuff that they did. Even if you got some vices, you need to protect your children from your vices. Because look here, what chance do they have if you don't mess them up at some point? You've squalled your way on to them. They've already been exposed. It's already in their system. If you want to kill yourself, that's fine. You grow. But don't kill a child before they have a chance to live. Possibly, the way things go these days, a crap grandma. I don't have to tell you the damage that that drug did to our community. It hit black people harder than any other race of people. And now they are older than most of y'all. It's a cycle. And it's not just a matter of quitting or giving it up. I'm getting ready to go deeper. What we're dealing with is sin and and if you're one of those people who don't understand the cycle, you need to spend more time around struggling people because they'll tell you their story if you'll listen to them. They will let you know how hard it is every day waking up with this thing. It ain't just a matter of giving it up. If it was that easy, they would have done it by now. Look here. I, I'm not saying that you have to enable an addict because please understand, I ain't giving no addict. I don't care who they are, no money. I don't care what you say. If I know you got that vice going on, I ain't finna feed your habit. I'm not saying that you got to enable an addict, but you at least need to understand an addict so you'll know what to pray for specifically. If it was as easy as them giving it up, don't you think they would have done that by now? All right, come here, let me get close to you. How about you give up gossiping? Because it's just that easy, right? How about you give up cussing? No, ain't nothing on the floor. Look at me. Look at me. H how, about, how about you give up shoe shopping for the rest of the summer? Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. What you think is easy ain't always easy. I'm talking about if DSW send you the email and tell you to come on, just delete it.
Paul says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law working in my members. It's warring against my mind and bringing me into captivity, forcing me to live. He says, oh, wretch, I got to close, that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? This is what I've been trying to get to, ladies and gentlemen. It's the point I've been trying to make since I got up. I thank you for your patience because this is what's going to help. The difference between my generation and my mama and them generation, we had and they had the same cycle. But what's missing is the conviction. I worked real hard just to get to that. Okay. When he says, oh, wretch that I am, it's an acknowledgement of the fact that what he's doing Every generation has its cycles, but what I see missing in my generation, it is the sorrow for our sin. Them old folks sin too, but as a generation, it seemed like they were sorry for it. But us, it's going to make us uncomfortable. There used to be a time when sin bothered us. Now we got a generation of people who are relaxed in their wretchedness. Okay, 930 will be ready for it. Y'all ain't ready. There used to be a time when sin wasn't so comfortable in the culture. But now we live in a culture that will support sin and the cycle of sin. Family has always been broken. Please don't act like that just happened in the last 20 years. Y'all been known some old men that had two families on different sides of town. You ain't going to know who your kinfolk are until you show up to your daddy's funeral. I wish I had some help in here. That's been going on for the longest time. But now we've gotten so used to it, we don't even teach our kids about marriage and family. Nobody's sorry for their sins anymore. Nobody's having an old wretch that I am moment. We just keep cranking out babies. Ain't trying to prevent pregnancy no more. See how quiet it get right up in there? And I'm telling you, it's an it's a issue. I can bring it up because y'all are the more mature service. I'm telling you, it's an issue that I keep on wrestling with. And folk have asked me. I've gotten in circles with preachers. And we've talked about it. And I still ain't got no resolution. What should we say to people about birth control? Because if they steady cranking out these babies that they can't take care of, I still wrestle, and I ain't got it all the way straight yet. I don't have an answer for you. I'm just saying, I'm not sure what we ought to tell people. I'm not giving you permission to do it, but if the joker's going to fornicate anyway, at least give them some, I don't know. But some of these folk, I wish I could tie your tubes in a knot. For, for, for some of you, I wish I could give you a vasectomy myself just to hold this thing down because we keep on bringing children in this world. We love these babies when they get here, but you ought not feel comfortable. Keep on bringing them here out of wedlock. I need you to feel my heart on this. I'm not talking about what you're doing, young lady, or what you're doing, young man. I'm talking about how you feel about what you're doing. The sin has been around for millions of years. I ain't talking about the sin. I'm talking about do you have sorrow for your sin? When is the last time you had an old wretch that I am moment? Look, it does not surprise me when people sin. What bothers me is when there is no sorrow for the sin. Trying to go with this. I know it's 7:30, but I do be wanting to open up with y'all sometime. Listen here. It does not surprise me when somebody say they gay. Don't surprise me, Shucks. We done had gay folk in the black community since forever ago. But the difference is now there's no sorrow for the sin. Gay athletes. That boy in the NFL ain't the first one to be gay. He did the first one to come out and admit it. But what you see now is a culture that is more accepting. And the danger we put ourselves in is that nobody's sorry for the sin. 
Re remember now, and some of y'all are old enough to remember this, that, that there used to be a time where men and women didn't even sleep in the same bed on television. It wasn't until the 1970s that they even showed a man and a woman in bed together. But now in 2014, you got men kissing their boyfriends on national television. And your children are growing up watching this on ESPN. I ain't talking about the sin. I'm talking about, are you sorry for the sin? Because what will happen now is that community out there will shut you down if you say something bad about it. Now you are in the minority if you got a problem with it. Now they make it like something wrong with us. I'm not talking about the sin. I'm talking about the sorrow for the sin. Do you know that homosexuality is still wrong? Do you know that fornication is still wrong? Do you know that addiction and drug abuse is a sin? The culture tells you you're okay, and the rest of us got to get used to it? No, 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 no. The purpose of this message is to sound the alarm. It'd wake you up early in the morning. Sound the alarm. There's a cycle going on. I'm here to tell you it's not okay for you to live how you want to live. Get mad if you want to. It's not okay for us to do what we want to do. It's not okay for us to act how we want to act. It's not all right for you to turn up how you want to. Not okay for you to lay up the way you want to. Not all right for you to just eat whatever you want to eat. Your body is a temple. And what you take into your body, you do need to be accountable for. You can't just drink everything. You can't take every imaginable substance in the world. You cannot submit to every vice that your flesh wants. At some point, you got to get on your knees and cry out for God to save me from my cycle. The question it's not whether you have sin. Because we all have. I know you didn't mess up. The reason I know is because I didn't mess up. But the question I want to ask you on my way out of here is, are you at least wrestling with your ratchetness? Ask your neighbor, does it bother you? Does it bother you just a little bit? Uh, are you convicted by it? Do you feel uncomfortable with what you're doing? Because the good news uh, for those of us that can't help ourselves, because I never just leave you feeling convicted. I told you I'm going to give you some comfort before we get to breakfast here. It, for the good news uh, for those of us that feel like we can't help ourselves. The good news is God don't expect you. I say, if you're struggling to help yourself, God don't expect you to help yourself. Paul says, oh wretch that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? In other words, I know I'm wrong, but I can't help myself. I know I'm addicted, but I can't help myself. I know I'm reckless. I know I'm wretched. I know it's ridiculous what I'm doing, but I can't help myself. I know it's breaking my mama's heart. I know it's disappointing my daddy. I know I'm dishonoring my heritage. I know I'm killing my community. I know I'm messing up my money. Keep sitting there here. I know I'm rolling the dice. I know it's risky. I know it's dangerous. I know God is not pleased, but who can help me when I can't help myself? Paul says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That right there ought to be enough for you and I to shout about. Because for the 112 people in here who know that you can't help yourself, the good news is uh, that God uh, does not expect you uh, to help yourself. We should have some help here. In other words, uh, on your own, uh, you can't kick the habit. Yeah, on your own, uh, you can't beat uh, that addiction. Fellas, I'm telling you, on your own, uh, or even ladies, you can't leave her alone. And uh, on your own, uh, you can't let that bad man go. <laughs> to all the shopaholics in here, on your own, uh, you can't stay out the mall. <laughs> 
on your own. Uh, you can't stop swiping uh, your credit or your debit card. Uh, on your own, uh, you can't be delivered from donuts. Uh, on your own, uh, you can't stop gossiping uh, and being so messy. Uh, for the private addict, uh, on your own, uh, you can't stay off the porn sites. Uh, on your own, uh, you can't stop looking uh, at images of other people's bodies. Uh, but Paul said, I thank God uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, I got a Savior. Uh, who can handle my cycles? Uh, have I got a witness here? Uh, I don't know uh, what you're dealing with today, uh, but I know somebody uh, who can handle my hangups. Uh, is there anybody here uh, that's got your own cycles? Uh, my sins uh, may not be your sin, uh, but thanks be to God, uh, she can handle all of our sins. Every addiction, every abuse, every demon, and every stronghold I had. My Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he is, he is a new creature. He said, all oh, things are passed away, and behold, all things, they are become new. So if there's anybody here that just can't help yourself, the good news for you is you ain't got to help yourself. All you got to do is be like David and say, create in me, great God, create in me a clean heart and renew the right spirit within me, oh God. In other words, I don't want to be acute and I don't want to be obtuse. I need a right angle relationship with the Lord. I don't want to go to the left. I don't want to go to the right, but I want a right angle relationship with the Lord, and when I think about the old rugged cross, I see four right angles put together on a hill called Calvary. He died. I wish I had some help here. I said he died. For your sin and mine, uh, he died uh, to get me right. Uh, he died uh, to break every chain. Uh, he died uh, to defeat every enemy. Uh, I'm so glad uh, that I got a Savior uh, who can handle my hang-ups. Uh, is there anybody here uh, glad that you know Jesus? Uh, he was hung up for your hang-ups. He died that Friday morning. But I'm so glad that he didn't stop there. They laid him in a bar of tomb. Stayed in the grave all day Friday, all Friday night, all day Saturday, and all Saturday night. But Great day, I said, Alex. Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. Why don't you grab somebody? I got to get my grits, man. Why don't you grab somebody and look him in the face and tell him, neighbor, whom the sun sets free. Is free indeed. Uh, he got all power uh, in his hand. Uh, I'm so glad uh, he's uh, working on me. Uh, I may not be uh, all I ought to be, uh, but when I look back uh, over my life, uh, I'm not uh, what I used to be. Uh, tell somebody. Uh, 
tell them please Grady tell them please be patient with me the Lord not through with me yet won't he do it I said won't he do it won't he clean you up? Won't he turn you around? Won't he make a way? Say yes! Say yes! Hey! 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 